better late than never is probably the most fitting phrase I can begin today's video with. Not only does it apply to what I'm doing right now, it also applies to the subject, Kingdom Hearts 3. It's no longer a myth, it's no longer a meme, it's a real product that exists and has existed for three years now. And yet, I still don't feel that it does. Since the fateful day I finished it, there's been something of a pit in my stomach. It just didn't feel right looking at this game. I've always known why, but not how, if that makes any sense. Sure enough, there are others who feel the same. I've seen my fair share of Kingdom Hearts 3 videos. And uh, I mean no offense to these content creators when I say this, but I just don't feel any video took the words straight out of my mouth, you know? With this one, I won't be satisfied until I do it myself. Full clarification, I'm not really in the trenches of a Kingdom Hearts community for reasons I'll probably make apparent by the end, so I apologize if I cover painfully familiar talking points in this video, hopefully it's entertaining in spite of that. Now, before we begin, as any good Kingdom Hearts fan would know, where there's light, there's shadow. And when I think of shadow, I think about today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. A console tier experience for your mobile device, Raid offers a truly endless sea of options with over 600 champions, and thus team combinations to your heart's content. Personally, of these champions, I'm interested in Venus for her astronomical versatility and rich fashion sense. But then again, you also can't go wrong with Cardiol. I mean, look at him, he looks like a final boss. If you ever want to be that final boss in the arena, here's your guy. For my fellow crit masters or dangerous debuffers, there's a champ for you in this realm. Also, fun fact, this month marks the third anniversary of Raid, so what better way to commemorate the occasion than by getting decked out in these first ever champion skins? Of course, I'm no stranger to personalizing my stuff, so don't mind if I do. Now today, if you click my link in the description or scan this QR code, you'll get a free starter pack worth almost $40. That's three champions, Misericord, Tiger Soul, and Romero, plus 10 Magic XP brews, 10 Force XP brews, 10 and spirit brews, there's a whole lot brewing. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. And it's that easy. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in the game. I do suppose the first order of business would be to convey my intentions. What I wish to do is look at Kingdom Hearts 3 and directly compare it to Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. Actually, hold on, that is base Kingdom Hearts 3, no remind, versus the final mix versions of 1 and 2. I am immediately going to tell you that this is a fair comparison for a few reasons. First of all, ever since the games launched on PS3 within their respective HD remixes, they have been the definitive versions for many years. This is now doubled by their presence on every modern console, uh, Switch versions notwithstanding. If any average person is looking to play Kingdom Hearts, they're going to be playing the Final Mix version included in these collections, and this was the case long before 3 launched. That leads me into reason number 2, which is the fact that Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix is like 12 years old by the time 3 comes out. So, in response to the argument of, well, Remind fixes things that sucked about the game, I'm not awarding any points for that. DLC should not exist to fix anything or fill intentionally gaping voids. I don't think it's unfair at all to expect that the massive AAA release in 2019 is able to match an updated game from 2007 in terms of directly comparable content. But it's DLC, so you don't have to buy the game again like Japanese players did on the PS2. Yeah, but I'm not promoting that practice either. I'm saying we should be beyond this conundrum entirely. Now, sure, you can buy the game today with Remind just packed in for $60. Except, Remind is like its own thing you have to play through. It's not even a direct update that enhances your regular playing experience. So regardless, you have to get through the game's original intended release to even get anything out of it. And after all that, eh, no thanks, I got stuff to do. One other thing I want to address is the notion that, uh, you waited 13 years for this game. Of course it's not going to meet your impossibly high expectations. For one thing, I did not wait 13 years. 
I got into Kingdom Hearts when the HD remixes came out. So if we're going from a time since I played KH2, I waited five years. Okay, wow, that is a relatively long time for how old I was, but still. For those who did play 2 when it first came out, well, um, I feel like most people expected it to be as good or ideally better than 2, like most sequels are supposed to be. I don't believe we can blanket the characteristics of what that looks like as unrealistic. Naturally, this discussion can often dip into one of my favorite video game discourse tropes, and that is, this game is great and you only have issues with it because you are blinded by nostalgia. You know, just yank this one out anytime there's a new release for an established IP. Boom, we're done. We can go home. Or how about this? Couldn't I then say that you are nostalgically inclined to have a positive outlook on this new game? Does your prior experience have no bearing on you wanting this series to be seen favorably? Now, I wouldn't prompt these questions, but anyone could. I truly wanted to love Kingdom Hearts 3. I followed its entire pre-release. I was excited for the game the whole way through. I thought everything looked great. I went to GameStop, everyone was having fun, it was good. This is on my list of games that, on the surface, really aren't badly made products. Ah, and that's what makes them so interesting, exciting, and frustrating to talk about when I do not think highly of them. But enough dawdling, let's dive into it. I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real? Or not? God, am I safe in saying that Kingdom Hearts gained an immediate spot in gaming history largely thanks to these breathtaking intro cinematics? Sure, yeah, you know, Disney, Square Enix, Elevator, whatever. But this, this trippy, unique CG cutscene with such instantly recognizable iconography, coupled with stunning music, which I can't play for you right now, in both Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, these would fondle your eyeballs, making sure you would never forget the game you're about to be playing. Kingdom Hearts 3 passes this test with flying colors, now aided by Skrillex, truly accentuating the dank occasion. Both this and the opening credits which you see upon booting up the game exist to get you pumped and run through all the history leading up to this point. It very accurately progresses the feeling 2 was trying to evoke with its intro, acting as a visual recap, only now it's going through far more than two games. On top of this, the moment you start a new game, you're greeted with a symbolic cutscene depicting a teenage Xehanort playing a form of chess with Ericus. I love this setup, I really do, the chess pieces each representing one of the 7 lights or 13 darknesses. Master Xehanort has been playing a long game, and it's finally time to witness its conclusion. I also can't go any further without first mentioning just how beautiful this game looks. You can't see it right now, but playing on PC with 120 FPS is just mind-blowing, and Motion Blur complements it really well. The characters have such a level of detail that especially hits hard given that we've basically been working with variants of PS2 models for so long. Seeing the reflections in Sora's dialogue of the heart is just wow. The tried and true method of selecting your power is also present in the form of memories, really hammering in the massive journey you've gone through to get here. Everything is going magically. But then, the absolute first sign of trouble shows up with Darkseid. In the original Kingdom Hearts, Darkseid is the first boss you ever face. By all means, he's piss easy, but he teaches you exactly what to expect from boss encounters throughout the game. Unlike a lot of enemies, you may have to stop and dodge attacks for a while. There may be multiple points for you to target. You can actually jump on top of bosses, and doing so may net you something extra. Simple. Very effective. Kingdom Hearts 2 features Roxas battling the Twilight Thorn. This battle is comparatively more hectic, encouraging the player to use reaction commands in order to both evade and approach the boss. Not only is there an alarming amount of visual flair to this fight compared to most of what you see in 1, making it rather exciting for a first impression, but it also teaches you the name of the game in 2. Bosses are now curated set pieces that place an emphasis on speedy combos more than methodical strategy. Nonetheless, you'll be required to react and 
and prepare accordingly to certain engagements. The battle with Darkseid in Kingdom Hearts 3 teaches you this. Uh, that's right, just uh, hover in the air and hit him a lot. You beat him, yay. Oh my god, wow dude, you're bitching about the tutorial boss fight. Yes, yes I am. Because I spoil nothing by saying that this boss actually teaches you what to expect from the game, just like its predecessors. What you can expect from most boss fights is to sit in the sky and mash the attack button to win. Part of this is because Sora just kinda doesn't fall in this game after finishing a combo. You really can just Peter Pan your way through this shit. In Kingdom Hearts 2, you would notably have a fair bit of lag before you can attack again after an aerial combo, meaning you would fall to the ground and give the enemy time to move away or attack, prompting you to reassess what you're going to do now that you may not be able to reach them. It's more than simply prolonging the fight because the encounters are designed to where gaps in your position will mandate a different course of action. Presumably because the maps are often more vertical in 3, Sora can just repeatedly hit the air until he tractor beams his way over to the opponent, even if they are really far away. This very basic change results in combat feeling more mindless in this title than the other numbered games before it, though I'll put a hold on that topic for now. Going back to the dark side battle, it's like not even some crazy new fight with him. It's just same old dark side, but now you wreck his day even harder. If it's meant to show growth throughout the trilogy, uh, I guess mission accomplished. But I think simply playing the game would suffice there because all that really happens here is that Cage 3 has a lamer first boss than 2. Okay, not counting Cypher. Oh, also, it teaches you that reaction commands, which are exclusive to each fight, seem like they're a thing of the past. This may seem good if you saw those as press triangle to win before, but just wait. Just you wait. Okay, so now I'm done with the tutorial, and now we're re- uh, oh. Okay, we're here in front of Master Yen Sid then. I don't need to wake up from dreams anymore, I guess. Yeah, the game just kinda starts where 0 0.2 left off, with Yen Sid telling Sora that he failed his Mark of Mastery exam and that now he needs to go get the power of waking through another means. How exactly do you do that? Yen Sid basically just says, Psh, I don't fucking know, dude. Go, go ask Hercules. So off you go. It's time to head on over to Olympus. How are we supposed to get there now? What? I don't know. Looks like all the old highways are closed. The old highway... Wait, what? What do you mean the old highways are closed? We just opened them in Kingdom Hearts 2. That was kind of one of the main things you would do in these worlds. As they later establish, it's not really been too long at all since then, and it also apparently hasn't come up before now, so why did this happen? Never explained, but I can tell you why. It's so Sora can solve the conflict entirely by believing. Okay then. Anyway, on with the game. Oh, <laughs> that's actually pretty cute. So, you know, you land in Olympus and everything's all shiny and new. You're finally exploring the whole land instead of a coliseum or underworld. It's pretty impressive. But <sighs> something just isn't right about all this. In Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, when you begin the game, you wake up in an original world. In both cases, the home world of your player character. What this does is immediately start you off with an iconic location you'll always associate with that experience. Sure, what you're doing for most of it it is just average busy work, and sure, Twilight Town is kind of infamous for being a three hour long prologue, but that's entirely the point. They're designed in this mundane fashion to make it hit harder when such a comfortable lifestyle is completely shattered. The Destiny Island segment is childish, with music that evokes a sense of worryless paradise. You're just a bundle of stupid kids making a raft in hopes that it takes you to another world. At first, the only fighting you're going to be doing here is sparring with young Final Fantasy characters and your douchey Pokemon rival Riku. These are great because they teach you the value of waiting for an opening in a fight, while also doubling as a way for you to hit kids with a stick and not get arrested. 
I, I don't know, maybe this is stupid, but I find it charming how Titus tells you that the kids all took on Riku 3-1 to one and got their asses beat. But then once you win against them individually, you can be just like Riku and fight all three of them at the same time. This, complemented by your two fairly challenging competitions with Riku himself, creates an intrinsic desire in the player to be as cool, if not cooler, than this guy. This then brilliantly culminates at the end of the game with an epic rematch. Just... Perfect. Cut. We're done. On the flip side, Twilight Town is totally rad, with a dedicated group of friends hanging out in some abandoned alleyway, lamenting the fact that school's gonna start back up in three days. Boom. Instant relatability. It doesn't take long before a bunch of weird stuff starts to happen, though, and Roxas appears to be at the very center of it. This going on for so long, at least your first time, is intriguing because there's a lingering mystery looming over your head at every turn. You have time to really call Twilight Town home before the unsettling, Matrix-style reality sets in. This whole section is awesome, and very quotable, too. That was undeniable proof that we totally owned you, lamers. Uh, so yeah, my point is that Kingdom Hearts 3 doesn't have any of this. Look, I know, I know. It's the conclusion to the Darkseeker saga. This clearly isn't the title to have a humble beginnings kind of world. I get it, but nonetheless, it's kind of weak to just be like, uh, well, we're in Olympus now, looking for something, I guess. Man, if only we had an engaging way of setting the stage for the conflict that is about to ensue, something that is straight to the point and shows us that this is no time to be fooling around. So anyway, let's go fool around in Disney World. I have to repeat though, it sure is great being on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. The way worlds can now mimic the movies they're based on is absolutely incredible. I've always enjoyed the more animated cutscenes in these games, but by Kingdom Hearts 3, you can now witness these moments without the nagging feeling of limitation. While there will be the occasional cutscene where the characters will stand there and use stock facial animation, the transition between these two forms of cutscene is a lot more seamless than the PS2 mouth I really, really hate in the other games. And not to mention that text boxes are a thing of the past, instead leaving us with voice acted dialogue that can play in the overworld. Anytime they would show this game off in pre-release, it looked really impressive, both from a cinematic and in-game angle. Though, I do miss the Nomura artwork being featured in the HUD. I say all of this right now because despite my earlier complaining, I think Olympus shows off the potential of this game pretty well. The environment is absolutely massive, the classic Disney characters are looking spiffy, there's quite a bit of location variety for one world, and the multiplied scale doesn't tempt the game to shed its simplistic progression. Essentially, I like this world because it feels just like a Kingdom Hearts 2 world, but expanded. Also, your resident world-exclusive party members will automatically join you in this game with no need to switch out Donald or Goofy. I really appreciate this because I've always wanted to maintain this feeling of braving the world as a complete team. The gigantic upgrade in terms of what can be on screen at once is yet again showcased with this world's boss fight, a battle against three titans. One of these being the Ice Titan, which was a super boss in one final mix, excellently showing the power level Sora has achieved by the beginning of this game. Things are going pretty okay, but... Hmm, I'm still not really feeling it. I wonder what could be going on, as I don't think this world is really doing anything wrong. It's just, I don't feel the attraction. <gasps> oh no! Wait, 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 wait! <laughs> Combat Discussion Part 2 Starting with Attractions In Kingdom Hearts 3, you can use Disney rides to attack your opponents, and you can do it almost immediately upon starting the game. When you initiate one of these, you stop, enter a minigame, and interrupt the music you are listening to with the Traverse Town battle theme. Every time. You are encouraged to use this because it results in everyone on screen being powerless to stop you as you destroy them with the power of fun. These come completely out of nowhere, in more ways than one. 
Sora just randomly gets the ability to pull these massive things out, and the same goes for how it works on a mechanical level. Enemies will commonly have these green rings, which will allow you to trigger the attraction. It does not take any magic, it does not take any focus. I really dislike this. They kill the flow of whatever you're doing, they make you look stupid instead of badass, and they cost absolutely nothing to use. Despite the fact that I'm only shooting myself in the foot by doing so, I avoid using these at all costs. Oh well, except for really serious battles like this one against Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, Xemnas, and Young Xehanort. This haphazard, lamau so silly inclusion makes for a very cynical Disney promotional edition. And you could say, well, if you hate looking at them so badly, just turn them off. Sure, and all the player has to do to be given the option to turn this obtrusive feature off is play the hardest difficulty in the game. Does that seem right? Wouldn't it make more sense to have it be optional in the regular difficulties than flat out turned off in Critical? Yes, I'm playing standard mode for this video, and the reason I'm doing that is because I want to compare the average experience most people will be playing for all three of these games. Also, it's been a while, I got limited space for these recordings, and I've never beat these games on Critical in the first place. <laughs> Just figured I'd be honest. Anyway, I'd hardly say it's good design to have to play a harder difficulty in order to have basic options. In fact, when it comes to all the other stuff I say about the combat, I'm sure it's a bit of a different story if you're playing on Critical. But in the other games, even after having played them before, I did not need to start the game on a higher than standard difficulty in order to have a moderate challenge. I should not need a strategy to avoid a button prompt. A button prompt which is shared with loads of other abilities, meaning you can accidentally do one of these when you didn't want to, and just... Uh, that then leads into the other situation commands. Things such as team attacks. Essentially, these are the limit commands from 2, only they randomly pop up and cost nothing to do. Then you have grand magic, super powerful explosions that will either be available after doing a magic combo or will just be granted by an equipment ability. I guess there technically is a cost for this, but it takes no additional MP to do and is yet another thing where you press triangle and everyone dies. Then you have form changes, this game's replacement of the dragon forms. In principle, these are fantastic. Each Keyblade you obtain will have its own form and weapon transformation. This means more stylish gear, more moveset variety, more excitement whenever you get a new Keyblade. Plus, they now allow you to upgrade your Keyblades, so maybe you'll be using one for a little while longer instead of throwing it in the garbage as you do previously. This is an incredibly welcome change. So of course, there has to be a catch. Sure enough, the new forms of Kingdom Hearts 3 can be activated with great haste simply by doing damage. Once again, they do not cost anything to do. It becomes a routine. You start the battle, you whack the enemies for a bit, you go Super Saiyan, then you destroy everything, and then maybe you go into a second form change within that form change. You can just rinse and repeat until the battle's over. But to be honest, the drive forms weren't exactly handled the best in Kingdom Hearts 2. I didn't really like grinding them up, especially when they could become obsolete thanks to later forms, and obviously anti-form was pretty irritating. But, these forms carried a tremendous amount of weight thanks to the fact that they were 1. Substantially more powerful than you are normally, and 2. Limited to the drive gauge. When you bust out the drive form, that's go mode. You're in. You're breaking the chains and you're not holding back. This feeling is completely absent in 3 because there is no end to the methods of nuking the entire screen. Look at this! Look at all this! Is this necessary? Oh, oh wait, one more, one more. Shot locks. These actually do have a limit. They, they use the focus meter. But I mean, at that point, it doesn't really matter. It's just one extra thing you can occasionally do to rain hellfire on your enemies. None of these feel exhilarating to pull off after a while because, well, 
when everyone's super. <laughs> well, I say that, but despite Sora's astronomically expanded versatility from the very beginning of the game, including flow motion where he fucking runs up walls, just about every recurring character will keenly remind him that he is weak and he needs to do better. It's like the whole junior heroes bit with Phil, only it goes on for the entire game and is usually coming out of people who aren't supposed to be full of hot air. And then, you know, Phil is actually in the game, but he doesn't even speak. Like, get him out of my sight. I don't want to see him unless we're going to the games. Well, if it isn't Sora and the King's Pawns. Huh? <laughs> Maleficent! Pete! Say, Maleficent, I don't know about his sidekicks, but Kid Keyblader here looks way punier than the last time we saw him. <laughs> I say we finish him off while we still can. Waste no time with the boy, he's inconsequential. Later, twerps! Alright, we're finally done with Olympus, and oh, we're checking in with Riku and Mickey now. Finally, right back to the story. This should be exciting. Let's watch. What's wrong, Riku? Are you tired? Do you need a break? We can stop. No, just... I've been here. I should know this place. But that all seems like another life. Well, gee, uh, think of all you've seen. All the feelings you've felt. Why, you've done years of growing in almost no time at all. Um, okay, oh boy, here we go. The writing in Kingdom Hearts 3 really, really sucks, and it's made quickly apparent in the first two hours. And now, I cannot progress any further on this topic without first addressing this sort of... <sighs> I, I want to say defeatist attitude towards it. That of course being the oh so frequently touted Kingdom Hearts stories have never been good. Almost every single time there's a discussion about the events that take place. If that's truly your opinion then that's okay but from where I sit it's become a phrase that serves the purpose of browbeating people to stop criticizing the plot, characters, or universe of Kingdom Hearts. A quick and lazy way to shut down somebody's feelings which are just as valid as yours. Imagine playing Kingdom Hearts for the story. Um, you mean the thing they spend a lot of time and money crafting? The thing that is told through hours upon hours of cutscenes? A thing that is not mutually exclusive along with the gameplay, music, etc.? I just find that awfully insulting to both the fans and the art form. Then, you know, you get the internet red carpet stuff like, of course the story sucks. It's supposed to be terrible. This only reads to me as intense copium. Because it's a series where Donald Duck says it's Sephiroth, that means there's no value to what emotions they were attempting to make you feel. None. When they showed Anti-Aqua in a trailer, they obviously expected people to run around saying DARKNESS and other hit Let's Play commentary instead of wondering about the fate of his character. When all Sora has left is taken away from him in Hollow Bastion by his old best friend, it was certainly never going to rival Shakespeare in narrative impact, so that must mean it wasn't genuine. Okay, you get it. This is not some boogeyman stuff. This is the diluted pool of conversation you have to sift through if you're going to talk about KH3. I like the story of Kingdom Hearts 1. It's really simple, and it is funny, but it does indeed have heart. What? I love the story of Kingdom Hearts 2. It tells a tale of identity, dramatically expands the universe of the first game, and has several iconic character moments. I'm really not asking for a lot. I truly believe in a story being good if it has conviction and solid characters. That's it. I'm not the person who will say, well, uh, the characters may be good, but uh, I went to school and the, the plot is... Uh, no, no, none of that. I went into 3 simply expecting an explosive and satisfying adventure. What I got was a repetitive, boring, and unsatisfying string of cutscenes. Sorry, I got a little distracted there. I should probably rewind of a cutscene we were viewing before. Strength to protect what matters. It reminds me of a promise I made. To who? Just someone I once met. Can't tell. 
Sounds like a good memory. Yeah. Jesus, this is dull. By this point, most counteractive to the improvements I mentioned before, you start to notice that something is wrong about these cutscenes. No, it's not the fact that the characters say the words heart, light, and darkness a lot. Haha, <laughs> though we will talk about that. It's the absolutely dreadful pacing. Characters will almost always have about a full second in between every line they speak. That sounds so pedantic and dumb to complain about, but I'm going to demonstrate to you how much that kills the mood of any given scene. Of course, there have been awkward scenes in previous games. The first Kingdom Hearts basically had this same issue, on top of some pretty stilted acting. But that was Kingdom Hearts 1 in 2002. When Kingdom Hearts 2 came out, the cutscenes were noticeably faster, the voice acting was also a bit more comfortable, and there were more fully animated scenes. Comparatively, Kingdom Hearts 3 has a lot less energy and flow. At first, I thought it was just the same, but made more distracting thanks to the greater horsepower. But alas, I can confirm that this is not the case. What makes this so grating is that often, several minutes will be taken up just to say nothing of importance. Characters will talk in circles about incredibly obvious stuff, or they will recap things that both you and they already know. Okay, I'm done with the pausing now. Cutscenes should usually feel like a reward, but that sensation evaporates fairly early in KH3. In just the opening three hours, our trinity frequently sits around not knowing what to do. Hmm. 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 Until eventually, they get the genius idea to just believe really, really hard. Yay! Look. I get it. I know. It's always been there. Abstract concepts have been the driving force for a lot of key elements in the Kingdom Hearts mythos. But not only is this routine getting a little bit old by the third numbered game, it's also exaggerated beyond belief. I can get into why this is actually a major problem, but for now I'm gonna leave it at how it destroys the player's investment in watching the story play out. Kingdom Hearts 2 still has the greater amount of cutscenes, but boy does it not feel like it by the end of 3. These cutscenes go on for a lifetime. By this point, Sora would be in Wonderland during KH1. Roxas' summer vacation would finally be over. But here, it's like three hours of nothing happening. The most noteworthy thing in this 2.9 block being that Riku gets a haircut from a heartless tornado? Uh, uh... You know, one of my favorite things to do in Kingdom Hearts 2, uh, this is probably really stupid, I know, was to use a drive form to finish off any mandatory fight. Not only was it satisfying in the heat of gameplay, but Sora would carry this form into the following cutscene. And man, it was kind of addicting to me, because you'd have Sora just chadly walking about in this bright, decked out magical gear, making these other people look like total plebeians. So I'm really excited to do this in Kingdom Hearts 3 with all the different forms I can equip. Oh. No, no, yeah, that's, that's cool. That's fine. Yeah, so I guess speaking of classic KH2 stuff, we're here in Twilight Town to find Roxas. Everything looks really pretty. The kids are wearing plaid just like we are. I, I guess that's just what's in with Nomura fashion right now. But, uh, hmm, I can't seem to go this way. No, that area's blocked off. Um, this place isn't even the same anymore. I mean, credit where credit is due. It's pretty cool how there are a bunch of people here to actually populate the place now. And I guess we don't need tubular skateboards anymore now that we can run up every building. Yeah, this is kinda lame. It's increasingly apparent that Twilight Town's sorta just here in this game, so they don't waste their E3 demo assets. Just like in the trailer, they even have you fight a demon tide, and then it just sort of fucks off with no fanfare given to its appearance here at all. Yeah, you know, just usual heartless stuff. Thanks for the save, Sora. All right, well, uh, can we go to the Sandlot and see how the Twilight Town Disciplinary Committee is doing? Hmm, I haven't seen Cypher around in a while. You didn't hear? He took off with Fu and Rai on some warrior's journey kind of thing. Ah, I see. 
First no Final Fantasy characters in the intro, then nobody in Olympus, now this. Oh, what's next? No Sephiroth? <laughs> I'm sorry, nothing's really happening in Twilight Town. This is what I'm left with. Like, we access the computer in the old mansion, but then everyone just sits around going, um, for about five minutes, and then we leave. Oh, and then Xemnas and Ansem Seeker of Darkness show up to say very mean things to Sora. Oh my god! There's cooking! We can cook some food that will give us temporary stat boosts. I think in my entire life, I have never once eaten anything in this game. No need. On an empty stomach, I'd tear the shit out of everything in my path. Ugh. You don't think Venom Chef can use flesh? Hmm. <laughs> Little Chef needs more ingredients. We better keep an eye out. Right then, on to the next world. Time to move. <gasps> oh, oh my god. Toy Story. Yes, we finally have a Toy Story world. Holy shit. Whoa, dude, this looks crazy. I'm literally in Andy's neighborhood right now. Look at how big this place is. Do you, like, I could just go in and out of Andy's window. No problem. Damn, I also got to say this battle music really encompasses that bombastic classic Pixar vibe. This is going to be awesome. Wow. Well, uh, I think I'm good on Toy Box. I think I'm beyond ready to leave because this place is a total drag. I'm sorry. I really am. I want to like this place, but almost the moment you step into Galaxy Toys, it becomes really boring. If I could describe why, it would be that it stops feeling like a Toy Story world and is instead more of a generic toy world. Like, you're not even in a film location. You're in some mall. So of course, this is basically an excuse to just make a bunch of whatever to occupy your time until you're done. Immediately upon entry, it's made clear that the central gimmick of this world is using giant mechs to efficiently clear waves of enemies. It's slow, you'd rather be using your own skills, but they expect you to use these clunkers as indicated by the sheer volume of Heartless you'll be fighting. So, unless you want to skip out on the XP, have fun. Sheesh, it's like they didn't really know how to make the world unique since they can't exactly do platforming challenges now that Sora can just run, fly, or shot lock over everything. In Two, that's what scenarios built around reaction commands will be for, but we don't tend to have those here, do we? Hmm. Yep, so what you end up doing for two hours is going up and down this massive building to beat up Heartless. You can go and explore if you want to, but since the worlds are so big in this game, you'll have to run through a lot of empty space before you find anything of note. The cheese of this shit burger is that the cutscenes are agonizing to watch. I mean it. Non. Stop. Talking. About hearts. And friends. We're going to stop the heartless. Wait just a minute. We're going to. What? You're going to? This has never happened before. Yes. We are going to. Because we like friends. We help friends. It's this for the entire world. And maybe this would be fine if it weren't so long. Go figure. This world is padded with a capital P. Oh no. We lost Rex. <laughs> Actually, he's okay. He was just looking at the video games. Now to sit through a really long cut scene just to hear exactly that. Or how about Buzz Lightyear's, um, I'm gonna call it out of character arc, where he doesn't trust Shora, Donald, and Goofy. Cue several exhausting cutscenes where Buzz acts like a douchebag to Sora for no reason, even after seeing that young Xehanort is responsible for everything going on. Oh, yeah, so like, apparently this toy box is a fake world that young Xehanort put everyone into as part of an experiment to determine if objects can have hearts. Okay, that's the dumbest thing I've heard in my life, especially because I'm pretty sure the answer to that very simple scientific question was perfectly clear long ago. So in the, ahem, conclusion to the Dark Seeker saga, Xehanort's basically making it a priority to pull pranks on some random kid and his toys. That's good. Obviously, the world is orchestrated this way so they don't have to worry about regular old humans and why Sora isn't one, but it also clearly means they don't have to make an exciting world out of Toy Story 2 or something. Like, I wanted to fight Zerg on the elevator. I wanted to go to the airport and ride the luggage, you know? Nah, nah, none of that memorable stuff. Let's just have Sora go into a video game and fight robots. That's 
kind of toy related, right? You want to have a duel with Lotso? Psh, forget that. Let's have a boss be a big UFO heartless. I just play the meme clip and let's get out of here. Whatever you're talking about, I don't care. Put Buzz back the way he was, then get lost. Or else what, toy? My guess is no one's ever loved you before. Because you know nothing about hearts and love. Wait, so like, why are we even going to these Disney worlds again? Ah, yes, we gotta find the power of waking. I feel as though Kingdom Hearts 3 has really brought the discussion of Disney worlds and their plot relevance to its boiling point. Many will inform you that these have always been very tangential and sort of a formality. Perhaps that is true, but surely there's a reason the topic is so prevalent in discussion of this particular game, no? Could it really be that people aren't remembering their precious little PS2 games correctly? Well, let's take a look. In Kingdom Hearts 1, the Disney worlds are more clearly linked to the main plot through the Princesses of Heart. In addition, the majority of the game focuses on the round table of villains led by Maleficent and their utilization of the Heartless. As far as the player was concerned, they were going to each Disney world in search of Riku, Kairi, and King Mickey. But they also had a secondary objective of sealing the keyhole in each world, preventing these places from being destroyed by the Heartless. A more simple time, truly. By Kingdom Hearts 2, things were a little less clear cut. You were still looking for Riku and Mickey, but you knew they could handle themselves, so it wasn't really a big priority. In a way, it starts out as a juxtaposition to the first game, where Sora's pretty much just chill with showing up to Disney World so he can help out the people who live there, many of whom he's now pretty good friends with. You see, it was kind of apparent from the beginning of the game that our three lads were sort of just going where the wind takes them, gradually learning more about what's going on with the new bad guys. Upon discovering that their campy, episodic journey through Disney Worlds was actually helping the organization the whole time, it suddenly gave everything a whole new meaning, a sinister edge and motivation. Meanwhile in 3, the game where there is a dire crisis on our hands from beginning to end, we're sorta just bullshitting around and hoping it accomplishes something. Every two worlds the game will cut to Sora saying that they should go to the realm of darkness and help the people who are actually doing something. Nope, no can do, need the power of waking, next world. Shocker, they don't find the power of waking lying on the ground. Oh well, next world. You can see that the difference this time is that what you're looking for is some stupid thing that'll pop out of thin air and not a person or an object, something you could realistically ask inhabitants about and thus necessitate the presence of worlds for. There are no keyholes to seal, there are no gates to open. This adventure is one big filler episode in a premise that's not very lax. Do I even want to talk about the Ever Disney worlds knowing this? Well, I'm already this far in and I don't think I'd be losing much in doing so because there are only seven of them. Yeah, that's seven compared to two's nine, not including minigame worlds. Why, if we look at all the major worlds, you know, not baby worlds that you're in for like 15 minutes, two has 12 while three has eight. It seems very clear that the worlds being so large in this game mandate a decrease in quantity, but that then places a lot of weight into their quality. If a world isn't fun, that's a much bigger deal this time around because you're stuck there for two to three hours. We're kinda one for one right now, so let's see how the remaining five are. Alright, woo, let's go. Next up we got Kingdom of... Oh, you know what? I actually think this world's pretty damn good. This one directly adapts the plot of Tangled, and I believe it is much better for it. The visuals and animation are fantastic, scarily recreating moments from the film using in-game graphics. And because we're following along with the movie, that means the cutscenes are tremendously more interesting than they were in Toy Box. Rapunzel! You're here, and you're okay. 
I find it really endearing, just a fun venture into the outside world with Rapunzel. Like, okay, on surface level, you literally are stopping to sniff the roses, yes? But the context makes it fun, and it works for me because they did such a great job making the environment feel pleasant to be in. The design of a world is fairly linear, but is expanded in a way that makes it feel organic to explore. I don't feel lost, I don't feel overwhelmed, it's not tedious to navigate, it's just right. Beyond goofing around with Rapunzel, there aren't any intrusive gimmicks like the mechs and toy box, so I feel the majority of what I'm doing is the Cool Kingdom Hearts stuff. I don't know, that's really all there is to it. I thought it was a cute, abridged version of the movie. The one gripe I have with the Tangled World is that you don't fight Mother Gothel. Sora interacts with her one time and then that's it. Instead, Marluxia shows up to, um... Hmm. Basically, he's trying to help Mother Gothel get Rapunzel back into her tower so that she is safe to be used as one of the new Seven Hearts, a set of princesses who are inheriting the light from those in Kingdom Hearts 1. Essentially, these would be a backup group of Seven Lights to clash with the 13 Darknesses in the event that Sora fails. I have a few questions about this plan, but uh, I'll hold on to that. So like, Mother Gothel dies the way she does in the movie, right? But then Marluxia comes in and transforms her leftover cloak into a heartless? Why? Ah yes, let's protect Rapunzel by summoning a giant tree beast. Better that than the evils of a cloak poisoning Rapunzel's light now. Blech. Though I have to say, this is probably one of the better bosses in the game because it requires you to actually, like, figure out and avoid things. You also have to run up Rapunzel's tower to hit it, and I thought that was kind of sick. Yeah, okay, next world. Monstropolis. I find this one kind of charming. It probably is a textbook hallway with enemies in it, but I thought it to be a decent adaptation of a world without following the movie plot. Getting to ride the rails of a door warehouse and slide through assembly lines was kind of what I expected for a Monsters Inc. world, though I kind of wish more people were here because it can feel a bit barren after a while. Something that's really cool is that they use the unversed for this world, playing off of the negative emotions taken from children in the movie. Their presence obviously marks the grand return of Venetus, although now he sounds like a ghoul for some reason. We haven't ever met in the flesh. I am Venetus. Hey. Sadly, I once again have to dock points because there is no Disney villain battle. Yes, the world takes place after the movie, but Randall still shows up in this game. He does directly try to kill you with booby traps in the factory, but eh, it's just not the same once you get to the end and fight a blobby, unversed boss. Like, if you're gonna have him here, it just seems logical to make some camouflage-oriented boss fight with him, right? Uh, I know this is probably a random thing to bring up right now, but I just saw this cutscene which I thought was really bad, so... Um, is it just me, or is Sora strikingly less intelligent in this game? Like, I mentioned before that the sheer frequency of people dunking on this boy can get very old and needlessly mean-spirited, but it's almost like they made him dumber to make it seem more appropriate. It's one thing that he doesn't know how to work the gummy phone throughout the game. I'm okay with that because we've already clearly established that this Islander child does not know how to technology. That's fun, that's cute, but what isn't is this part here where he rushes over to a company computer, which by this point he has firmly admitted he can't work, and attempts to use it before Mike and Sully can even take a look at it. Then, despite him usually being the voice of reason in the group, Goofy has a surprisingly stupid idea. Maybe it would be faster to just break it. Oh, that's brilliant! Oh, never mind. Shut me up. Jeez, yeah, let's break this expensive supercomputer owned by these people we just met. The fuck is your problem? Sora's kinda just like this throughout the game, and given the fact that I just played it, I can confidently say he wasn't this way in Kingdom Hearts 2. He wasn't like this in Kingdom Hearts 1. Sora was always a young and headstrong fellow, but they've now taken that to mean that he goes wow over like everything he sees. What, did he de-age five years after Dream Drop Distance? It's a really annoying exaggeration of a character, and obviously his aging voice actor doesn't really help either. Master Richard, it's an honor. Hey there. Show us, show some respect. What? No fair! 
What about my outfit, master? Shut up! Though to give credit to him, and not so much the overall story, he's not entirely an observant. This is the part where you spout some mumbo jumbo and disappear, right? They're after a new seven hearts, which seems to be code for, let's go bother more princesses. Arendelle. Holy moly, this is possibly one of the worst Kingdom Hearts worlds ever. And yeah, I'm sure Disney executive meddling had everything to do with it, but it is what we're stuck with. The raw suckage is made immediately apparent by Larkzine throwing you into a generic ice labyrinth where everything looks the same. It sets the amazing precedent for our heroes to wanker around while the actual story happens elsewhere. After about 30 minutes of doing that, the player is blasted by a full CG remake of Elsa singing Let It Go, featuring Sora, Donald, and Goofy. If you like the movie, then I hope this is a treat, but it's absolutely hilarious to everybody else. Like, I find it so cringy and unapologetically corporate, but that also makes it the most amusing part of the world. Remember when you could go sing with Ariel in the optional Atlantica world in Kingdom Hearts 2? It was pretty great. They kept the random Disney sing-alongs out of a main scenario where I just want to have anime duels with guys in black coats. And Pete. Then, when you were done with all the Atlantica songs and it was time to say goodbye, this happens. Even though we're hitting the road, our words are all connected. Which means we are free to come and go. And sing! So don't be sad and always know we'll come back soon to say hello. Oh! 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 It's so precious. That means these guys rehearsed their own song on the way over here just for little old Ariel. Oh. Meanwhile, in this frozen wasteland, everyone's just kind of singing for no reason at all. And then Sora just sits there. It's the most awkward, funny shit you'll ever see. They say I have courage and I'm trying to. I'm right out here for you. Just let me in. Yeah, my friends sometimes have musical breakdowns too. It's always good to just let them get a verse out. Hey, I'm over this way. Hey, I'm over this way. Sora. Hey, I'm over this way. I'm <gasps> over here. Hey, I'm over this way. Oh my God, make it stop. <laughs> Hey, hey guys, I, do you want to build a snowman? More like, do you want to climb a mountain? Come on, it's so much fun to play. I'm starting to get really bored. It's such a chore. It's going on all day. Like, dude, nothing happens in this level. You just go up and down, up and down. Even the Trinity points out how stale this is getting. Good thing snow's so soft. We could do this a hundred times. And no, it does not make it better. Man, I don't know. Who's this world for? Who, who's the person who's like, yeah, I like Elsa a lot, but man, I really want to go fight Heartless with Marshmallow. <sighs> really? Well, whoa, who, who's this guy? Where's he taking Elsa? Why is he taking Elsa? W wouldn't you like to know? Boom! Big ass wolf Heartless in a void. C can we just time out for a sec? What is going on? Why is there a whole movie happening like two steps ahead of me at all times? I mean, I've seen the movie, so I know what's happening, but within context, it's just a bunch of random crap that Sora keeps walking in on. Furthermore, this is the fourth Disney World in a row where we do not fight the villain. Hans is right there, he's clearly willing to get his hands dirty, but you do not even interact with him. I kind of wonder if by now they think it's too unrealistic to have wall-running, building-slicing Sora fight relatively tame Disney characters, but if that were the case, then there's just no game at all. Nothing would really pose a challenge unless it were a Xemnas tier threat. It was always very exciting to me how they would think up a unique boss battle for every villain in 1 and 2. Like, even if they were kind of shit, I would at least appreciate the effort to be true to those characters. It's a major part of the crossover identity the series has, being able to immerse yourself and temporarily believe that these Thugginators can actually give Sora trouble. Be it playing games with Oogie Boogie or making Captain Hook walk the plank, each world
world would end with a memorable experience. So you can imagine I'm not too pleased when we just forgo all that amusing, character-driven stuff in favor of, oh my god, it's a massive heartless, it's spewing darkness all over the place, go, 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 like every world. Ironically, I think it actually has more style and substance to just have a traditional scuffle rather than this explosive yet cliche approach. If we're going to be promoting Disney movies, that interactivity is what I want to see. Not this news cruise where Sora, Donald, and Goofy proceed to stand there and not interact at all with their new friends. Do not dare touch this sacred movie! Buy it on Blu-ray now! <sighs> okay, two more worlds to go. The Caribbean. Caribbean? Blech. This world has a lot going for it. I definitely understand why to many people it's a highlight of the game. I, however, don't really care for this one. Being one of the two returning Disney worlds, I will certainly give it credit for how much of a glow up it's received. Holy shit. It's just night and day. Makes you feel like two was made in the Stone Age. Sora, Donald, and Goofy now sport a more appropriate look, and everything seems hunky-dory. Yet, I find that this is all overshadowed by feelings of intense boredom brought about by how it's structured. To begin with, it introduces underwater sections. I really don't like these because they basically serve the purpose of negating your abilities and making navigation more cumbersome in the process. Also, I don't understand why I can't switch Keyblades underwater. It's not a big deal, really, but I have to ask. Keyblade switching is something I kinda neglected to mention before because I don't think it normally adds much except convenience. If anything, it actually subtracts from the game because now it doesn't really matter what Keyblade I go with, I can just switch between high strength or magic on the fly. I can't do that underwater, I suppose. Better conserve that energy for mashing the attack button. Oh boy, we're finally on the surface. Whoa, I get to sail a ship? Shit, okay, that's pretty cool. At first, it soon dawns upon you that they literally let you explore the vast, wide-open seas with your ship. Ambitious, I must say, but I kinda wanna just get to the part I came here for, and that's fighting Xehanort. So, I'm not too interested in the prospect of slowly maneuvering this boat around, especially because I find the music in this place to be rather droning. And no, I'm not insulting Yoko Shimomura, certainly not. For you see, she did not single-handedly make this soundtrack. It's no coincidence to me that all the lesser pieces in the game are not done by her. Not exactly trying to insult the other composers, either, but I do have to admit that there's a jarring difference between this soundtrack and the other games. Anyway, even if you keep to the beaten path, you're going to be very familiar with ship-to-ship -ship combat because that is the central gimmick of a world. <sighs> I feel like an easy way to make a Kingdom Hearts world not fun is to take up a significant amount of time with the players stripped of their customized RPG components. I think part of why Pride Lands is so boring to a lot of people is the the fact that Sora is stuck with only basic lion techniques and magic. You can't occupy yourself by leveling drive forms, and you can't really go about situations in a different way. You just run and hit things until it's over. The same principle sort of applies here, and speaking of which, you also get one of these bosses. The ones that take an eternity because the only way to damage them is through a really tedious exclusive mechanic. I mean, yeah, I wanted variety, but there is such a thing as going too far in the other direction. Ah, finally. No more swimming, no more sailing, no more uh, smoke grinding. Port Royal, what kind of mischief will we be getting into here? Find 300 crabs. Yeah, I, I suppose that would be what we do now that Port Royal is one big explorable area. I don't know, you look at stuff like this and you're like, are there no other ideas for this world? Nonsense, my boy, because right after this and until the final act, it's a long stretch of heartless ship filler. Good, I'm beginning to see a pattern. The events which take place here are complete bollocks as well. I have absolutely no idea what is going on in this place since this time I haven't seen the movie. That usually was not an issue in the previous titles because they would tell and show 
you all you needed to know. But not today. It's really bizarre when they play a bunch of cutscenes which clearly had a lot of time and effort put into them that a lot of people, especially kids, won't understand because the majority of a plot lies elsewhere. Then you have the Kingdom Hearts exclusive stuff, which is really grating. Sora has an insufferable presence in this world, not just because of the aforementioned long speeches about how good the heart is, but because he's just so excited to be a pirate! I mean, that sounds odd to complain about in a vacuum, but it's a fairly evident example of Sora's flanderization. In Kingdom Hearts 2, Sora wasn't exactly blown away by the prospect of joining Jack's crew. At most, he was rather amused. The game kind of understood that Sora's been to many places, fought many foes, literally sails the cosmos. It's like this kind of admirable dynamic where Sora, this boy who lived his whole life on an island, is now too cool for the pirate life. Meanwhile in 3, he's like bouncing all over the place. Oh my god, Jack Sparrow, that guy we all love and trust. I want to be like him. I want to have a ship. I... What? At this rate, it's a wonder that he was able to contain himself while he was a prisoner on Captain Hook's ship at the age of 14. Gee, I'd almost say that the character had more nuance in his debut appearance. Fuck, honestly, the events of Port Royal borderline didn't even happen as far as this game is concerned. At one point, Luxord shows up and initiates a parley with Jack. If this sounds familiar, it's because this exact thing happened in Kingdom Hearts 2. There, Jack explains to a wary Sora, Donald, and Goofy that a parley is honored as pirate code, so he honors it, only to be tricked by Luxord. In Kingdom Hearts 3, Jack explains to a wary Sora, Donald, and Goofy that a parley is honored as pirate code, so he honors it, only to be tricked by Luxord. Hello? Oh, well, wait, I guess it isn't actually him. It's... it's a bunch of crabs. Okay, that makes more sense. I can't even do this! Well, despite the two-hour-long ship show that the Caribbean has been so far, I have to say, and I am quite happy to say, that you finally fight a Disney character in this world. I mean, like, a real character, not fucking elemental monsters. I'm fighting Davy Jones and his Kraken, so it is possible, thank the lord! You know what? Hey, the finale of this world is pretty neat. I like seeing Sora, Donald, and Goofy absolutely lose their shit in this dramatic CG cutscene upon Will Turner getting stabbed. They also kick back and watch a man get thoroughly destroyed in the middle of the ocean. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, time for... Oh, San Francisco! I really liked Big Hero 6, so this is surely going to be really exciting, especially as the final Disney World. Then there's no time to waste. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Going through rings! You can tell this is gonna be a good one when it practically opens with that. Oh, sorry, it actually opens with you fighting Heartless, which is an appropriate first impression. Luckily, we don't have to worry about the world feeling too gimmicky like the Caribbean, because all you do here is run around a massive landscape and beat up Heartless. I have barely anything to say on this place. There is one time where you save the members of Big Hero 6, and that's kinda cool, but I kinda get the feeling that this world took a lot less effort to make than the others. There's also this one time where you need to chase after these data cubes, um, which are over here, I think. No? Where are they? Where am I even going? Uh, okay, I guess I'll fight Heartless for now. Sora, I just marked the target position. Oh, thank you, hero. Thank you for the heads up. I kind of question if this is really any better than Hallways of Enemies, because now it's more like extremely large room of enemies. It also is a surprisingly short world, so I guess it's not too offensive when it only caps out at like an hour and 30 minutes. The world takes place after the film, but it actually ties back into that story by having you face off with Dark Baymax, the original model being corrupted by Dark Cubes. What a sick concept! I mean, this was so cool of an idea, that they felt the need to announce it with concept art. Oh, and it's only a really stale, bland aerial battle. Well, they tried. There's also seemingly going to be this sad angle of it, where the original model's combat chip needs to be destroyed. But then Hero just makes an identical one, and now there's two Baymaxes, literally two of the same character model, just standing there. I mean, that was kind of a bittersweet moment in the movie, you sort of ruined. Our probability of success is- You don't have to crunch the numbers, Baymax.
It's not the sum of our parts. It's the sum of our hearts. Die! Wow, so that's it, huh? Those are all the Disney worlds, and really, I only like two of them. One of them is alright. The rest, I think, are either remarkably unimpressive or just plain garbage. And you know what? I would honestly say the exact same thing about the Disney worlds in Kingdom Hearts 1. Revisiting the game for this video, I still enjoyed it, but in retrospect, I recognize that a lot of its locations are really annoying for one reason or another. However, most of these can be chalked up to jank that one would expect from a first entry. I cannot say the same about 3. Not only this, but I also unironically think 1 has more interesting combat, meaning that the central game loop isn't quite as dull. Never mind the fact that I'm more engaged with the story and bosses. If I'm honest, even the best worlds in 3 feel a little too long. Everything overstays its welcome in this game because they put so much work, so many eggs into these 8 baskets. So we are presented with this multi-hour block of ambivalence. Now, I've heard the argument that every world being a massive time sink is better than having to revisit worlds in Kingdom Hearts 2. And let me just say, I could not disagree more. World revisits may appear to be filler before the world that never was, and it definitely is apparent when you go waste your time in Agrippa, then have a shitty Genie Jafar boss fight, yet I would argue that the pros certainly outweigh the cons. Having worlds essentially be segmented into two halves results in a much smoother pace. Aside from, of course, the prologue of the game, you are never stuck in one place for too long. Pride Lands would be insufferable if I were stuck there for almost two hours, but thankfully, I am not. So even if I'm not enjoying my time there, I'll be on my merry way before I know it. The other benefit to this approach is that it makes the setting of Kingdom Hearts 2 feel more like an organic JRPG world than a list of levels. These are all places with their own activities going on while Sora's busy elsewhere. So when you return to them, you're checking in on how your friends are holding up. You're seeing how much things have changed in so little time. This is embodied by Hollow Bastion, the big bad dungeon from the first game being rebuilt into the resident Final Fantasy world it once was. This once dangerous place is now like your home base. This is where all the bros are hanging out. You familiarize yourself with the world enough that you care about what's going on there. So when the Battle of a Thousand Heartless occurs, boldly marking the halfway point of your adventure, Holy shit, this is a moment for the gamers. 3 doesn't have any of this. There is no Traverse Town, there is no Radiant Garden, each location is a one-stop shop. It's all about timing and presentation, because believe it or not, stuff is happening while Sora's on his quest, but you wouldn't be remiss to think otherwise. So I've gone over how in each Disney World the organization has had a member appear to cause trouble. Kinda. That is more or less what's happening, but the actual logic behind it is dubious. You'll have young Xehanort and Dark Riku who basically show up to antagonize people for no reason, but then there's that business with Marluxia and Larxene. Their goal of finding the new Seven Hearts is definitely one of the more productive things the organization is up to, but it's handled so poorly that it blows my mind. Marluxia wants Rapunzel to be protected from the darkness of the world, so he goes out of his way to make sure she's locked up in her tower. But her tower is occupied by someone who he very clearly knows is, uh, bad, very dark, very mean. He is also summoning his legion of heartless and nobodies to this world. So he tells Sora to protect Rapunzel from what he is sending at her, then knocks Sora out once Rapunzel is back home only to realize that it's probably bad for Rapunzel to be around Mother Gothel's darkness. Does that make any sense? Would it not just be better for him to do nothing at all? What is Larkzine even doing in Arendelle anyway? Apparently, she is here to follow Elsa around and determine if she's one of a new seven. However, she repeatedly blocks Sora from reaching Elsa, saying that she needs to make the choice between light and darkness herself. 
Um, why? Does it really matter if Sora interacts with her? If his presence would accelerate Elsa's connection with Light, wouldn't that actually work out better for the organization? What was even the plan here if Sora didn't show up, just to watch the events of Frozen play out and go, huh, what do you know? I guess both Elsa and Anna are princesses of Light. The answer to that question is yes, because that's exactly what happens after Sora was barred from the story. Okay, well, now that you know that they're both part of the new Seven, it would be wise to kidnap them, right? It's what Maleficent did in Kingdom Hearts 1. No, we're just gonna leave them here and wait for Sora to succeed or fail. Magnificent plan. By the way, after this, the plot point is dropped entirely. It never comes up again, save for this cutscene where Sora explains it to Riku and Mickey. Nothing new is discussed in this cutscene, and they even repeat Ventus's outburst from earlier, prompting everyone to remind Sora that he lacks the power of waking. I'll save her. Huh? <laughs> but Sora, that's gonna be super hard since you don't have the power of waking. Huh? Sorry. I have no idea why that just popped out. I'll go. What? what? Is that wise? You need the power of waking, Sora. Do you have it? Uh... No. Probably not. Are they even reading the script? So you have the heroes waddling around, mouth agape, accomplishing nothing, and you have the villains making themselves known as utter buffoons before the final confrontation has even begun. Close it, quick! And besides, I've already got all that I want, mate. It's really funny and memorable, it's even more of that Disney interaction that I want to see, but I would sooner call it misguided. Then there's the case of Vexen, who has returned to the organization as a reserve member, only to reveal that he did this so he could betray them, for he wishes to atone. What? How does that work? How do you even go from, I live for research regardless of the cost, to, aw shit, my science hurts people, that's not good. At this point, stuff's just happening. You don't even need a reason for it. Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, interrogates Ansem the Wise about a mysterious girl. That same mysterious girl is apparently the reason Lee and Isa joined the organization. I wonder what this could be foreshadowing. This begins the trend of mobile setup. Stuff that will not mean anything to you unless you've been following the Kingdom Hearts Key Saga. Evidently, Marluxia, Larxene, Demix, and Luxard are lost Keyblade wielders. Mobile setup? <sighs> okay. It's one thing to ask the player to buy full games that take place in between numbered entries. It's one thing to leave some plot threads open in your game to be expanded in one of these handheld games. But asking the player to play some procedurally updated mobile application where everybody looks like fucking Bitmoji avatars? That is where I draw the line. No. I'm not doing that. There's no way you can expect most people playing the game to be doing that. But surely you need to be paying attention to these things to understand the complexities of Kingdom Hearts 3 specifically, right? Anyway, yeah, Demix of all people is here, and before he can even do anything, he is convinced by Vexen to turn good as well. Can I ask, why were these two even invited? Wouldn't the master planner Xehanort have contingencies for this kind of thing? You would think his vessels would share his will, ensuring that they wouldn't turn on him. I was going the entire rest of the game wondering if this was a ploy of some kind, but no, these two just walk on in and provide the good guys with a replica so they can bring Roxas back. Oh my god, what a bunch of idiots. The true Organization 13 is embarrassingly incompetent. They are a far cry from the original team. That's really saying something when you think about what the original 13 was like. These guys were a bunch of multicolored nutjobs who had very different personalities and motives. This led to a bunch of bickering and internal strife, so it's not really a wonder why they were defeated by two kids. Yet, Xemnas still had a more solid plan than the very team who 
would become a part of in the future. All the organization had to do in Kingdom Hearts 2 was egg Sora on, causing him to release more hearts and hopefully slip up and die in the process. If his Kingdom Hearts wasn't ruined, Xemnas may have actually won. So in 3, instead of doing the smart thing, which would be to force the Seven Lights to clash with them prematurely, the organization just goofs around and gives Sora plenty of time and even resources to come kick their asses. What a waste. On that note, we're finally getting into the thick of it. As if clockwork, Riku and Mickey get into trouble within the Realm of Darkness right after you're done with the Disney stuff. So now that it's urgent, we have no choice but to go to the Dark World. But hmm, ah uh, hmm, we still don't know how to get there. However, will we figure it out now that Riku and Mickey cannot help us? Why, of course, this recurring problem, this sub-conflict that's gone on for 18 hours, is solved simply by Sora believing really, really hard. Just go do it. That was the answer. Go to the Destiny Islands and just do it. A good job. Sora descends like fucking Jesus Christ himself and saves the day after Riku and Mickey were powerless to stop anti-Aqua. You know, I really wish I could get excited for this showdown. I really wish this were like the hype gamer moment of 3, but it just feels lukewarm. I mean, they spoiled it during pre-release, there's that. But even within the space of the game, I'm just over it. To have Riku and Mickey, two characters who were really badass role models in 1 and 2, just be sidelined entirely, I find really disappointing. The implication that the two of them together don't stand a chance versus Anti-Aqua while Sora is literally called upon to beat her single-handedly carries a dangerous omen. It's not authentic character growth because this fucker has been off in La La Land all game, after losing a lot of his strength too. Riku and Mickey have had no such problem. If anything, they're supposed to be better now than ever before, universal difficulty in the Dark Realm withstanding. And yeah, it is just that simple. Come right on in, beat the crap out of Aqua, and hooray, she's saved. Glad that her whole 10 year wait in hell could be paid off with this. As soon as you know it, Sora and Aqua immediately go save Ventus too. <clears throat> I want you to guess. No, Sora finally learns the power of waking here, and I want you to guess how he does. Have you got it yet? Do you know how Sora learns the power of waking? Why? It was within him all along. All he needed to do was believe. All the Disney worlds, all the jokes, all the ingredients, they lead to this. What is the point? Why not just say that Sora delivered Ventus's heart back to his body by coming into direct contact? Does there really need to be this whole pseudo-scientific angle around it? Yes, apparently there does, but we're not there yet. Uh, good morning, Ven. Um, eh, never mind. So we got the seven Guardians of Light now. We're ready to go to the Keyblade Graveyard. Yep, really. Tomorrow, pack your things, take a shit, go to sleep, get some Chick-fil-A, we set off at sunrise. Where do I begin? So, it doesn't take a professional editor to decipher that this game is backloaded as fuck. I am not kidding when I say that when I got here for the first time, I actually thought this was the halfway mark of a game. There's no way that's it. There's no way the game literally is just, you do seven Disney worlds and then the rest of a game is the Keyblade Graveyard. But no, that's exactly it. While yes, I have gone in detail about the various cutscenes throughout the game, it all kind of blends together as empty happenings. The really important stuff doesn't happen until the very end, but you feel that you've accomplished so little by that point that it doesn't even seem like the end. The pacing of this game would be so much better if you gradually saved the Keyblade wielders between worlds. They make it appear as though this would be the case, having you actually get to play as Riku within the opening. You think, oh, maybe between every Disney world there will be a major event happening in the main story with the other characters. And well, kinda? But
but they usually amount to nothing in the short term. The only other character you play as would be Aqua going up against Vanitas, which again is right here at the end. These admittedly exciting personalized moments could have happened throughout the game, and it would also provide us more screen time for those previously separated heroes. It's the most awkward thing how Kyrie and Lee call me Axel from now on. Oh, um, okay. Kyrie and Axel show up here after training off screen. You get some really moving CG cutscenes with them, but that's it. I thought maybe they'd be the ticket to saving Xion, but nope, that might have been something interesting for them to do. This is the only time they have in the game to talk with Sora and the others, but they barely even do that. Sora's got like, no chemistry at all with Kairi anymore. I genuinely have a hard time believing that these two even love each other, because they barely talk. When they do, there's no antics, no laughing, no fun, it's just, gosh, I care about you. If I were Sora, I'd be calling up Kairi nonstop, making up for lost time, not knowing if any of us will even be here in the future. Does Kairi even say a word to Riku in this game? I, I genuinely don't remember those two interacting at all. <clears throat> this is all very touching, guys, but where do I fit in? Ven looks just like Roxas. Or is it Roxas looks just like Ven? And now I have to explain all of that to him, which is in itself a crazy long story. And apparently everybody already knows everyone, and this is an insane amount to get memorized. God, everything's so sterile. Axel is the dry and sarcastic person with the catchphrase and the quips, oh that rascal, he is very funny. After literally saving everyone and getting that godforsaken power of waking, Sora is still teased for not having the arbitrary title of Keyblade Master. Ho ho ho, this sure is the calm before the storm. I am glad we are all getting to know each other in this cutscene right just now instead of during some big adventure. Why the fuck are we even going there tomorrow anyway? The organization's genuinely twiddling their thumbs waiting for us to show up. We could train, we could try to find Roxas, we could maybe rally together our friends from each Disney world, but no. Let's go see Xehanort now. Must have got this idea after visiting the Little Einstein world. Oh man, I'm starting to meander as much as the game. Go grab some snacks, get something to drink, because the real Kingdom Hearts 3 has only just begun. To begin with, I have to say I am kind of iffy on the idea of our final showdown happening once again at the Keyblade Graveyard. On one hand, it retroactively and symbolically makes the secret endings of Kingdom Hearts 2 allude to the events of a third game and not just Birth by Sleep. This would make it a pretty exciting parallel to the secret endings of Kingdom Hearts 1, which depicted events that we would see in 2, but ultimately unfolded in 358 days over 2. That's probably the coolest way I can look at the Keyblade Graveyard's presence in this game, because the other way I see it, we totally missed out on having an awesome final level like in 1 and 2. The end of a world always gives me goosebumps, playing that transcendent, ominous music from the very beginning of a game. Everything looks all trippy, you see gummy blocks lying everywhere. This really is the heart of everything wrong going on in KH1. Did I also mention that you fought fucking Chernabog, complete with the music and everything? No, I didn't, but I am now. Meanwhile, in Kingdom Hearts 2, oh man, the world that never was may be one of my favorite locations in all of gaming. A beautifully dim, dystopian, yet modern city that houses an onslaught of heartless and nobodies. The perfect atmosphere for Roxas and Riku to have their iconic duel, and that's only a portion of it. Above the city floats an abstract, monochrome castle, and at the peak of it, Xemnas's Kingdom Hearts. It was exciting to finally get to this seemingly untouchable location that you would see in cutscenes. You've seen this council sit on their high and mighty chairs for so long, so it felt liberating to reach their mysterious fortress. Kingdom Hearts 3, once again, doesn't really have this. You go to a desert, one that you've already seen before, and one that does not change. I understand the significance of this location, but I don't know, it's just not a very interesting place to be. Then again, maybe, maybe this place is like the Hollow Bastion of this game, and there's some real, true final dungeon like the end of a world. 
right? Another thing is that when you set up this battle in the Keyblade Graveyard, you kind of expect it to be as exciting as the Birth by Sleep video from 2007. Unfortunately though, it is not. The moment you land here, you are greeted with another battle of a thousand heartless. What is this, organization rehash? You'll forgive me for finding this a little bit lame. Here I was expecting, uh, no, being told to expect a Battle of the Ages, but what I first come across is a sloppily copied idea from the midpoint of Kingdom Hearts 2. I reiterate, I seriously thought I was only halfway through the game, uh, maybe two-thirds. Perhaps it'd be a bit of a different story if this were like the Thousand Heartless battle on crack, you know? But it's basically the same thing, only this time there are mini-bosses thrown in. I'd give points for Donald and Goofy actually being there and not just in the prior cutscene, but uh, now there are a bunch of other people who disappear. No, oh, my mistake. Sorry, I forgot. This one does have some more spectacle. You get to summon the mountain coaster like you did against the rock titan. Choo choo, kaboom, we did it. Okay, well, now that we're done enticing the whole family to go to Disneyland, can we get to the Keyblade War? Oh, yes, but first. <sighs> one of my most hated cutscenes in any game I've ever played. The Guardians of Light regroup and are met by Terra, who we all know is actually Xehanort within Terra's body. If you are somehow still playing this game and you didn't know that, never fear, Riku and Mickey explain this concept to themselves early in the game. It's the most ham-fisted thing possible, and I don't know why they do it. If you're playing this game without playing the others, you're gonna be confused regardless of what they do. And even then, there exists dedicated recaps for you to brush up on if you so desire. Ugh. Anyway, so yeah, pretty much everyone here should already know that if they see Terra at the Keyblade Graveyard, it's not actually him. But then we get this long, drawn-out cutscene of Aqua and Ventus realizing that it's not actually him. Did they not talk about this yesterday? Like, this is the absolute worst of the cutscene pacing, by the way. We're finally getting into the really dramatic stuff, but the entire vibe of the situation is sucked dry by how delayed everyone's reactions are. Today is the day you all lose. What? It's fucking hilarious, like, they start playing the epic masterpiece Fate of the Unknown as Terranort hits Ventus across the map. Really slowly. And then Aqua reacts to this, eventually, at any moment now. Just give her a bit. She's getting warmed up. Everyone proceeds to just stand there as Sora runs at Terranort and then gets his Keyblade stuck for a bit. It's like this battle is a turn-based cutscene. Once he's done with Sora, he then turns to Axel and Kairi. Their turn. Okay, well, they've been really hyping up the rise of Kairi and Axel as Keyblade wielders. I can't wait to see how far Kairi's grown since her level 1 status at the end of KH2. <gasps> <laughs> Duh! What is this? Wow! Kairi stands there like a deer in headlights and gets defended twice in a row. What the hell are they doing? Uh, well, admittedly, there is this pretty sick moment where Donald casts Ligma Flare and, like, dies. I like that. But then I don't, because unlike Kingdom Hearts 2, where everyone goes fucking apeshit and tears through a bunch of enemies when Goofy's been injured, everyone looks around and gasps as a massive heartless tornado appears. Then, and this is not in the least bit hyperbolic, for the next four Four minutes, everyone stands there and dies. It takes forever. The demon tide just waits until everyone's done talking and then picks them off as they basically unzip their pants and say, just do me already. It's not even against someone cool. It's not like the organization came on down and murdered everyone. No. This dramatic Sora scream from the trailer was for a fucking wall of Goombas. I have no more words to describe my disappointment. Oh, that's real nice. A Sonic Forces text box. 
Well, thanks for watching, everybody. I mean, where do you even go after that? What, what kind of mystical shit do we get into to rectify this mistake? Sora wakes up in something of a purgatory for hearts that are not yet ready to pass on. This is called the final world. Oh, okay, hold up. Maybe we do get an awesome original final level after all. <laughs> Wrong. This place is absolutely nothing but padding and misty setup. Misty mobile setup, even. Here you get to talk to a bunch of mysterious dead people that you don't know, and you even get to say hi to Naminé. Oh yeah, I kind of forgot about her. I'm sorry, we interrupt this exciting trilogy conclusion so that you can run around and collect 100 Zoras. Because collecting 300 crabs in Port Royal was just so fun. Ooh, and after that, how about hacking away at this lich boss? Seven times. Did they think that maybe this was a little bit overkill? I get that they want to make it seem like Sora put in the effort to save himself and his friends, but I have a better idea. Maybe they shouldn't have had a clumsy death scene in the first place. So yeah, okay. Sora not only is able to resurrect himself from the dead thanks to Kairi's light or whatever, but he also is able to use the power of waking to fly across every world, save every one of his friends, then go back in time to before they ever died. Fuck it, why stop there? Why not have Sora start singing When You Wish Upon a Star with Jiminy Cricket, causing the entire team to float over to Xehanort in a giant bubble of happiness, which then explodes and brings everlasting joy to the universe. The end. <clears throat> Let's continue. Thanks to Sora's, you know what? No, I'm calling him a Gary Stew. Thanks to Sora being a Gary Stew, everyone is right back to the Keyblade graveyard. I like how they frame this scene as if Kairi just pulled this badass move. Sora looks at her like, oh, that Kairi, thank you for existing. That really pulled me out of a rough spot. It's so weird too. They get here and they're like, yippee, time travel. Let's do it right this time. And then the exact same events play out, as if they forgot what happened. Did I miss something? No, they just go on like it ain't no thing. Like nothing ever happened. That's right. You can basically cut that entire previous hour of the game and lose nothing at all, because what you just witnessed were trailer shots. Are you for real friends right now? Suddenly, Lingering Will appears because Naminé called upon him, somehow, and he fends off Terranort. Okay, power scaling. The seven Guardians of Light, including Sora, can barely hold their own against Terranort, but meanwhile Lingering Will is able to engage him solo? This is really contrived. There's no weight or reason for anything happening at all. They just decide on a whim whether or not Sora can obliterate everything in his path. Lo and behold, nobody dies this time, even though nothing really changed about history other than Lingering Will showing up. Everyone's somehow good to fight a bunch of Heartless this time, and so you do. They have you fight the Demon Tower again. Jeez, what is the infatuation with this idea? You're already tired of seeing it by this point, but now you gotta fight a Damage Sponge variant of it. Oh, good. I I'm really not impressed by a bunch of shadows flying all over the screen. I'm sorry, but it's still not done. They make such a big deal out of this stupid thing, as if it's like this amazing idea, this climactic moment you'll want to see over and over again. Sora gets help from a mobile game character most people don't know or care about, but they treat it like he's fucking Spider-Man. Then, oh hey, this is actually pretty cool, a bunch of Keyblades show up that are actually registered players of the mobile game. For this wall of generic enemies, they decide to bust out the portal scene. Christ. Oh my god, even Master Yen Sid appears. I mean, this is all really nice, but holy shit. Why on earth is this more dramatic than the actual Keyblade War? Yes, no more filler, no more games. Time for the conclusive battle that has been building up for many, many years. And now, again, I think it is totally fair to expect some really big, impressive, multifaceted segment when you consider that we're on the PlayStation 4 and we're literally recreating scenes that were previously CG. 
and doing that pretty well, I would say. Imagine a spectacular battle that involves 20 people at one time. That is well deserving of a title, Kingdom Hearts 3. And instead of a large-scale battle across this gaping canyon, it's a series of hallways and boring boss rooms. Yeah. I mean, I say that they're boring, but maybe they're more exciting if you're on critical? I don't even know if that would really make it feel a lot better, though. The main draw to this is that you're finally fighting alongside your Keyblade companions, including Kyrie, holy shit, and you are fighting multiple bosses at once. It's kinda what I wanted, but like in the bootleg carnival plushy kind of way. It's hard to get excited once you realize that the Keyblade War amounts to you being locked into empty rooms to do the exact same thing you've been doing all game. Wail on the enemy, and they eventually die. Nothing really happens that makes it memorable or climactic, it just happens. I know that sounds kind of broad, but comparatively, in the castle that never was, I was climbing a fascinating environment. I was blitzing through hordes of enemies with my drive forms. There were loads of badass or funny cutscenes, and I was rewarded with boss fights that each had their own unique idea surrounding them. Like, I'm never going to forget the Zigbar fight, you know? I don't remember anything about these fights in 3. They're downgrades to what they were before, and with the exception of Luxord, they're all solved the same way. What's more is that they're positioned in this really awkward fashion where every time you beat one of the bosses, the entire fight stops for them to go, ARG, you got me! What, do the other members go take a smoke while this is happening? What, why is everyone standing around? Some of these villain speeches are great, some of them are hilariously dumb, and some are, of course, set up for future games. It just... Uh, it just makes the experience feel like a checklist, and that unfortunately spills over into genuinely good moments as well. The reunions of A Birth by Sleep and 358 trios, in a vacuum, allow me to release dormant emotion. But it's kind of ruined when these feel like obligatory cutscenes that you just had to cram in there and then move on from. Nothing that could have been done about that. Let's rewind a bit here, because the way the 358 trio gets reunited is absolutely stupid. Sora, Kairi, and Axel are fighting Xemnas, Saix, and Xion. How in the- Oh, I see. It is revealed in Secret Reports number 7 that apparently her design documents still exist, so her body was able to be reconstructed. Okay, but if that's the case, I then ask why memories of her even had to be wiped at all. Just build her again. Doopity doop, she has her heart. Now everyone remembers her again. I guess at that rate though, I just don't think she and Roxas needed to come back. It was kind of it was kind of a tragic point of her story that they had to cease existing for Sora to reawaken. So anyway, Roxas beams in out of nowhere. He's back. Surprise. Uh. I mean, it's fine. We knew this would happen. I like these characters, whatever. But it's so rushed. Roxas's replica body just comes down like he's Thor with Stormbreaker. That's so dumb. If it's this easy for him to come back, then the whole conflict behind this character's existence is ruined. But the reason he had to do this was because the way they decided to pay off Axel's character was this. Sorry, boss. No one axes Axel. Got it memorized? Is this supposed to be a Keyblade? Or is it some sort of joke? Yep, Xemnas, I'm right there with ya. What a joke. Then, as if written by some cosmic comedian, Xemnas says, I ain't leaving without you, bitch. And he... kidnaps Kyrie. This girl has been taken a third time, the third numbered game in a row! Well, that's okay. Because obviously, she's going to be joining us for the dazzling final battle against Master Xehanort himself. Just one question. Why? Why would you do this? Why do you have to treat your characters this way? 
Who likes this? Does anyone like this? Uh, do, do fans of Kyrie like this? Do you make your Kyrie every time we touch AMVs thinking about how great this moment is? I'm sorry, it's not your fault. I... <sighs> Let's talk about a little girl named Kyrie, okay? Kyrie has always been a character under a fair amount of scrutiny. She's part of the original Destiny Iowans trio, she's had her character design updated twice, she's in all the promotional material as if she's a very important character, but she mainly spends her time waiting around for someone to come save her. Sora and Riku are iconic characters who each go through their own turmoil. They both are able to fight and leave a physical impact on the universe of Kingdom Hearts. It's jarring frustrating to some that Kairi is a glaring outlier in this trifecta. Yet, I've never felt that this character was intolerable in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, because I always knew they were going to get her where she needed to be, alongside her friends, not just at home, not just in spirit, but everywhere they go. That's been the entire drive since day one. It seemed like such a logical arc. In Kingdom Hearts 1, Kairi was the light of Sora's life. She really wasn't anything special, just someone he cared about, someone he grew up with. A pure spirit that anyone would want to be around. Although, I don't know about that, she kinda raises some red flags early on. You know, Riku has changed. What do you mean? Well... Hmm. You okay? Sora! Let's take the raft and go! Just the two of us! Huh? <laughs> Just kidding! Just a cute little story about protecting those you care for. So in Kingdom Hearts 2, when she's safe at home, she feels the urge to reach out to Sora herself, not even remembering much about him thanks to the events of Castle Oblivion. This culminated with her getting a Keyblade of her own, so that she could protect him too. But the real great part about the final act of KH2 is that you were finally teaming up with Riku. He's no longer a pawn, and he's no longer hiding in the shadows. It's for real, baby. Let's go whoop Xemnas as equal partners instead of competitive rivals. It seemed so obvious obvious that this is exactly what would happen with Kairi in 3. Clearly, her role was to be Sora's motivation, a smiling face away from all the darkness of each world, one that he can think of and see himself going back to, but no more. That third Roman numeral in the title should have been her. It carries a sense of payoff that wouldn't have been there if they were just an elite team from the start. The reason why Kairi was likable before was because of how she brought the emotions out in Sora, and now it was going to come full circle. But no. All that just gets thrown away. I don't understand it. I can't conceive the thought process behind making these emotional CG cutscenes for her and Axel just for her to be a hopeless, bland, shitty liability at the end of a game. You know what? Axel's not off a hook either. How do you do this to him? How do you make him a comic relief character, trashing his Keyblade that you so proudly set up at the end of Dream Drop Distance? What was wrong with this character still meaning business, but now his own and not the organization's? Actually, fuck it. Why is Roxas a cameo? He doesn't even interact with Ventus. He doesn't even. He just, they glance at each other like, whoa, and then that's it. That's the extent of these characters in this game. That's all there is to see here, because after this point, after this point, it's time for the climactic battle with Master Xehanort. I love how the ever Keyblade wielders are written out of a story here, by the way. It's really compelling. All of them are kept back to allow Sora to go fight him. Just let that sink in. This conflict, which concerns each and every single one of these characters, sees them all excluded. Everyone is so inconsequential in this game that they don't even bother having all of them team up against Xehanort. Nah, Sora believes hard enough. He's got this. I mean, fuck. Who's to say that Xion can't believe as hard as Sora? What makes him special? I don't even feel like it's this badass thing when Donald and Goofy join Sora one final time because we literally did this with Ansem in Kingdom Hearts 1. Yeah, uh, I know these three can beat Xehanort's Heartless, but can they beat Xehanort with a completed Keyblade? You know, the legendary weapon that took him over a decade to get? If so, how does that work? They can barely even beat Terranort. <sighs> Sorry, let's get on with it. Oh, okay, for real this time, my mistake. It looks like we actually do get a proper final world. Xehanort's homeworld, the location teased at the very start of a game. Scala and Kylum. Not. 
It's a boss arena. You don't explore Xehanort's home. You don't get to see what went wrong in this boy's life. You don't learn anything. Go play Kingdom Hearts Dark Road on iOS or Android. You save your game, walk forward, then boom, the final boss starts. It's like every promising idea that could be just isn't in this game. Likewise, you would imagine that the Keyblade would present you with, like, the craziest final boss ever, but it doesn't. In fact, that's not even just a matter of expectations, because I think the final bosses on the PlayStation 2 were better. Yes, even Ansem in the slower-paced Kingdom Hearts 1 was more exciting to me. It was this crazy shit where you first had a duel with him on your dead homeworld, then he becomes a traditional Final Fantasy abomination strapped to a massive heartless battleship. It's wild. Yeah, you pretty much win by casting Arrow and healing at opportune times, but the moment was incredible for it being the first title. Gradually saving Donald and Goofy throughout the fight also made it more satisfying to finally beat this guy. I almost need not even mention how cool Xemnas is. Slicing through buildings, chasing a giant dragon ship thing, battling him as he literally just sits there in a suit of armor. <laughs> Holy shit. Then it peaks in a realm of utter nothing. Nothingness, the final phase being the most simple, yet deadly of all. Xemnas in a pure white haze, having a frantic, laser-deflecting lightsaber duel with Sora and Riku. Absolutely incredible. So for Xehanort in Kingdom Hearts 3, you first run around hitting replicas of the people you just fought. Yeah, it's 13 of them at once, but it certainly doesn't feel like it since they are intent on just disappearing and reappearing to waste your time. Okay, well, now we're fighting Xehanort himself, but he's a goat? Also, why is he using No Name when he has the Keyblade? Ooh, watch out. He's turned the place upside down. Now we're... Oh, great. Now we're underwater. Yeah, I actually died here because the underwater combat kind of turned my movement routine on its head. Well, that's one way to challenge me, other than making this boss take a fucking eternity. Admittedly, it does prompt you to dodge things, but it still feels like a complete damage sponge without being interesting enough to feel like a long, climactic fight. I kind of imagined I'd be barreling through this whole city, having the most visceral, brutal battle with this old man, but uh, it really just feels like a mega long version of any other boss in the game. Again, kind of why I don't like them spamming these larger-than-life heartless bosses makes the final boss a little more samey. Xehanort will, at last, pull out the Keyblade for the final phase, and you know, there's cool stuff like him firing lasers from keyholes, or him forcing you into rage form, but that's kinda it, really. The fabled clash against the Keyblade doesn't feel too much greater than, like, the Roxas fight in 2, so, eh. Though part of that may be the music, because I'm, I'm not gonna lie, this one's not really doing it for me. fucking whiny violin sample that they also use during the pirate world. Ah, jeez. Darkness of the unknown, this is not. Of course, the Trinity defeats Xehanort with the power of friendship, and it's here where we get a truly special piece of information. Xehanort reveals that he was actually a sympathetic bad guy all along, only doing all of this so that he could reset the universe and create a realm with no darkness. What? Okay, let me tell you why I liked Xehanort and why this reveal is fucking stupid. Xehanort has always been a man of unbridled ambition, committing heinous acts of cruelty purely for his own gain, and yes, his idea of greater good. This trait of his would extend to his heartless and nobody. I absolutely loved collecting and reading the Ansem reports in Kingdom Hearts 1. It was here where you would discover the motivations of a game's villain, who himself didn't really appear much at all throughout the story. 
This would then return in 2 to describe the journey of the real Ansem, Ansem the Wise. So these were really fascinating to pick up and read throughout the games because they told you a story about these guys who were clearly a lot older and more knowledgeable than anyone you were hanging out with, right? This story about a man named Xehanort was then the centerpiece of everything going on. So it was kind of cool when you eventually got to see the truth behind his machinations in Birth by Sleep. In the hidden reports of that game, Xehanort wrote to himself, quote, I believe a balance of light and darkness is what sustains our world, but too much of a darkness has been stamped out, disrupting that balance. Someone must tear down this tyranny of light and reorganize the world around the darkness which then creeps back in. So what is this bullshit about only using darkness so that he could create a happy land of light? Xehanort's entire conflict with Ericus was that he believed it only disturbed peace for light to eliminate darkness. That was his well-intended motivation, but obviously he took it too far, and eventually he spawned beings that reflected his thirst for both knowledge and control. I kinda thought the point of a story was that both Ericus and Xehanort were wrong, because they tried to force their beliefs upon everyone else, excellently put by Riku at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2. You accept darkness, yet choose to live in the light. So why is it that you loathe us who teeter on the edge of nothing? We who were turned away by both light and dark, never given a choice. That's simple. It's because you mess up our world. So it really bothers me how they try to frame this ending like, Oh, there there, Xehanort. You don't have to fight any longer. It's okay. Ericus understands. We understand. No! I like how he recognizes Sora's greatness and passes on the Keyblade to him. This should be a really fulfilling moment. You could even say Sora becoming the true Keyblade Master in the end. But it just doesn't feel earned. Sora didn't outsmart Xehanort. Sora isn't stronger than Xehanort. Sora didn't do anything. Sora is literally just a guy with friends. And because Xehanort has no friends that are currently alive, he is free to actually die now. Bye bye We'll find Kairi. Let's head back to Master Yen Sid. We can figure it out. No. I know what to do. Sora! My whole journey began the day I lost her. And every time I find her, she slips away again. I thought we'd finally be there, but she's out there, alone, not for one more second. I don't care! That's right! Thank you, Donald, Goofy. But this time I have to go alone. Sora, listen. The power of waking isn't to go chase hearts around. What? What do you mean it's not for chasing hearts around? I was just doing that for 40 minutes. Although, if Mickey is trying to tell Sora that Kairi should stay dead, then hey, can't argue with the mouse. Everyone has a happy ending, including Isa, who I guess is good now because we'll take his word for it that he had good intentions the whole time. Look, I'm all for forgiveness, I am. But this dude is literally one of the biggest assholes in the series, and now that we're rolling with the logic of nobody's having a heart and conscience, you can't just say it wasn't really him. It's not even a story of forgiveness, it literally just happens because they're setting up a story. They're just good now, everything's good now. Nam is back to life. She was only on the cover of the game, but hey, I'm glad she could appear just in time for the ending. Oh look, even Kyrie's back to life. Yep, all's well that ends. Oh, well, that got kind of depressing. I might have applauded this for being a conclusive, heroic sacrifice, but they already want the player to be keenly aware that he'll come back one day, so cool cliffhanger. Ah, but there's more! Apparently Zigbar is alive, and he's also Lushu from Kingdom Hearts Key, now summoning the Foretellers to present day. The contents of a black box are still not revealed, which means that Maleficent and Pete wandered around doing absolutely nothing at all the whole game. That's right, to all the people who sat through the really boring Kingdom Hearts Key back cover, it was set up for a post credit scene in Kingdom Hearts 3. Wow. This ending sucks. <sighs> Come on, there's gotta be something in here, right? Something, something kinda cool for me to latch onto before I say my goodbyes? 
Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 had a recurring super boss in the form of the one-winged angel himself, Sephiroth. And not only that, but by the Final Mix releases, there were quite a few really challenging boss fights the player could spend their time trying to beat. This shit was always really exciting, embedding memories into players for ages to come. The Final Mix versions even traditionally included super bosses that would serve as teasers for future installments. So I'm really excited to see what Kingdom Hearts 3 has. Oh, okay. Well, there's no Colosseum. I, I kind of miss the Colosseum. Instead, you get these battle gates, which you have to go hunt down in every world. Only through doing these do you get these secret reports, which you would normally get in various places throughout 1 and 2. And the majority of them are mobile setup, instead of enlightening pieces about the actual story of the game. Great. So, after doing that boring shit, I can finally fight this game's super boss. Yes, the one singular super boss. Well, in base Kingdom Hearts 2, that one boss was Sephiroth, and then he left with Cloud to fight another day. So surely, we're going to be capping off the trilogy by having our final battle with this guy. We're going to be doing safer Sephiroth this time. Oh, I'm preparing my ass cheeks, dude. I'm ready to get one shot. Let's go. Right. All right. Okay. Sure. Final Fantasy characters aren't important to the world and story of Kingdom Hearts. We also didn't have time to put them in, probably because we're making giant Disney worlds. Although even the Disney is feeling a little lacking in this game, you feel me? Not to worry though, not to worry. Why there is Final Fantasy in this game? Or is it perhaps in the next game? I think it's actually pretty symbolic how a significant portion of the official Toy Story Kingdom Hearts world was used as a trailer for Verum Rex, a clear nod to Nomura's very own Final Fantasy vs. 13. Why I believe it is symbolic though, well, it's because Toy Story represents Kingdom Hearts 3, and Verum Rex obviously represents Final Fantasy vs. 13, but it also represents Kingdom Hearts Key. Toy Story is given a shiny, technically sound, but incredibly weak showing that doesn't understand why it was special in the first place. Then, what appears to be the highlight of the world is Verum Rex, something they oddly focus on a lot despite it not really correlating to what anyone came to the world for. In other words... Kingdom Hearts 3 is a game that, to me, feels like it did not want to be made. Is that presumptuous to say? Perhaps, but those are the words that echo through my mind, watching those credits roll. I know it isn't just me. To paint the picture a little better, I first want to read this paragraph from the letter Tetsuya Nomura wrote for the release of the game. I had quite a tough time writing the story this time around. So many characters appear in this game, with each of them having their own set of problems and needing to choose their own fate. They are characters that were born over the course of 10 plus years, and each character has fans who love them. I ask for everyone to see their stories to the end, and see what each of them grasped from their stories. I rewrote the ending multiple times, and took a lot of time deciding how I want it to play out on the screen. After much thought, I ended up keeping it simple. I believe that Kingdom Hearts 3 is truly completed when the two thoughts, whatever you feel from playing the game, and my thoughts that I've secretly placed in the game, match up together. I hope that everyone playing the game will complete the game for us. My thoughts and yours. Well, with all due respect, here's what I think. None of the characters chose their own fate. Nobody made any tough choices. It was a story of good guys versus bad guys. Each character does have fans that love them, which is why I'm so puzzled by the cheap, plastic endings each and every one of them received. I don't think these characters grasped anything from their stories. Not in this game, anyway. What is there to grasp? Nothing matters anymore? Everything will be okay as long as you have friends? Hope you're lucky enough to be friends with a main character? Truthfully, I have a hard time believing that this ending was rewritten multiple times. This? 
you rewrote it multiple times and ended up with this? But indeed, I suppose the ending was kept simple. It would be much easier that way, rather than challenging what people believe about you creatively. I can clearly see that there may have been a grander tale at some point while making this game, but in the end, that did not happen. Now, as far as what I believe your thoughts are, Tetsuya Nomura, the ones you have secretly placed in the game, I believe you are tired of Kingdom Hearts. You were tired of this story that's been looming over your head for many years. You were tired of being expected to work on this. You were tired of what people expected this game to be. Maybe you're even tired of what people know as your style. So Final Fantasy vs. 13 was going to be your big break. That was going to be closer to what you're really interested in, right? But eventually, shit happens, time passes, you're told to stay in the Kingdom Hearts factory. All right, all right then. If you can't make Final Fantasy vs. 13, perhaps you can make Kingdom Hearts 4. A boom! Yozora secret ending. Looks an awful lot like Noctis, don't you think? Isn't Noct, uh, I mean, Yozora just so cool? Gonna be pretty exciting when we see what he's about. Presto, Yozora is the super duper final boss in Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind, which then leads into an ending that recreates the vs. 13 trailer shot for shot. Oh, and on the topic of secrets, you also have plenty of those regarding the Foretellers and Subject X, a story that I may even say this game is more interested in telling than the actual conclusion to its own saga. But story ain't everything. Gameplay checks all the boxes that you would expect out of a Kingdom Hearts 3, yet it's scribbled all over the written section of the test. Even Hundred Acre Wood has been nerfed into a one-trick puzzle land that lasts 30 minutes. Combat is shallow. The based action focus of 2 is gone, but the traditional strategy focus of 1 is also missing. So what we're left with, I don't think even remotely resembles what a Kingdom Hearts 3 would look like if it had released shortly after 2 on the PlayStation 3. Go figure, the best we could do is look at those old Kingdom Hearts games and try to emulate it, but ironically, we end up with a game that I believe is everything people accuse Kingdom Hearts of being. The spark that was there in the period between 1 and 2 just isn't there by 2019. That passion lies with Yozora instead of Sora. And while I know a lot of people are interested to see where Nomura wants to go next, I'm not. I was interested to see how they would conclude this saga that I always felt had conviction, fantastic set pieces, endearing characters, and a truly legendary crossover appeal. I wasn't following the development of Versus 13. I was following Kingdom Hearts. If I'm not in the mood to do that anymore, well, I guess that's okay. The conclusion I'll enjoy has always been there in Kingdom Hearts 2, so I guess things aren't so bad. This franchise has always been Nomura's baby, even if he has to pay child support to Disney. And you know what? I can respect it, and leave it at that. What I can't respect, however, 